All right, uh, thank you all for coming. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so yeah, thanks for coming. This is probably one of our more exciting events here at Verso. Um, we'll be passing around uh, event sign up for if, if anyone's interested in getting on our uh, listserv for events and parties. Um, this event will be live streamed to our Facebook and we'll be live tweeting. So if you'd like to tweet it out, just be sure to tag Verso and we'll, we'll be sure to see you. We have books on sale. If you'd like uh, China's book to be signed, I'm sorry, China, but um, we have them on sale for 20 over there as well as all of our Russian Revolution series books um, are 50% off. We do take card and cash and please help yourself to beer and wine. Please be 21. Um, so tonight we have China Mayville. China Mayville. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, China Mabel is a multi-award winning author of many works of fiction and non-fiction. His fiction includes The City in the City, Embassy Town, The Scar, This Census Taker, The Last Days of New Paris, among many others. He's won the Hugo World Fantasy Award and the Arthur C. Clarke Awards. His fiction, his, excuse me, his non-fiction includes fo photo illustrated essay, London's Overthrow and Between Equal Rights, a Marxist History of International Law. He's written for various publications, including the New York Times, The Guardian, Conjunctions, and Granta, and he is currently the founding editor of the quarterly Salvage, which you should all subscribe to at www.salvage.zone. Um, the New York Times recently commented on that his novels skitter among genres, map, magpiping elements from science fiction, fantasy, urban fantasy, traditional fairy tales, steampunks, and horror. So perhaps the weirdest thing that Mayville could do at this point is write about the real world, which is what he does in October, his new nonfiction about the Russian Revolution in 1917. Uh, for tonight's talk, uh, we have with us, we're thankful to have Barbara Allen and Bhaskar Sankara, uh, Associate Professor of History at LaSalle University in Philadelphia. Barbara Allen has published num numerous articles on the history of Russia and the Soviet Union and is the author of Alexander Shlyapnikov, Life of the Old Bolshevik published by Haymarket Books, and we have it available on sale. Uh, also joining us is Bhaskar Sunkara, founding editor of Jacobin Magazine. He is the editor of several books, including ABCs of Socialism, published by Verso, and Europe in Revolt, Mapping the New European Left, published by Haymarket Books. Um, after the uh, presentations, they'll have a discussion, uh, then we'll open it to Q&A. Um, and afterwards, please feel free to stay for drinks and discussion. Um, yeah, and thank you for coming. Thank you all so much for coming. I would stand, but I think if I do, I, there's no, this mic is too low, so my instinct is to stand. Um, but, uh, so I'm being more formal in my imagination. So, um, just one tiny thing I have to say, I'm one of the founding editors of Salvage. No, 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 I just, I, I, I really cannot take the bulk of the credit. The bulk of the credit is our, is our editor-in-chief, Rosie Warren, who is here. Uh, um, thank you. <laughs> Um, and thank you also very, very much to, um, to Barbara and, and Bascal. The, I couldn't have better interlocutors. I'm really honored. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little reading from the book for about 15 minutes, but I, I want to kind of set the scene first, which is, um, and I apologize, incidentally, if anyone's heard me talk about this book before, I'm going to repeat myself. I only have a certain number of opinions and thoughts. Um, I just have to kind of try and recycle them as creatively as I can. Um, this book is uh, it's obviously some, somewhat unusual for the sort of things that I have mostly written. Um, and it had a, an unusual etiology in, in several senses. One of them being that, the, that uh, when I was discussing this book with Sebastian Budgeon, my editor, uh, we were expecting to be jostling in a crowded marketplace. We thought centenary of the Russian Revolution, whatever your politics, one of the most epoch one of the, the epochal event of the 20th century and beyond, you know, we're gonna be fighting for space here, so we gotta make this as good as possible. So there's good news and there's bad news. Um, you know, the good news is we're not fighting for space in terms of narrative histories, especially for the new reader. The bad news is we're not fighting for space with narrative histories uh, for the new reader. Um, because of a kind of, uh, a kind of systematic p political forgetting, I think. Now this book, um, the bulk of the book, this is a book, a, you know, a, a history written by a leftist, although it is not uh, a history for leftists necessarily. Um, it, uh, but I have my heroes, I have my villains, and particularly in the epilogue, I do start to kind of engage somewhat with more of the kind of political issues uh, and the, um, 
the shadow cast backwards from history uh, across the incredible events of 1917 itself. So I'm going to do something I would never do for my fiction readings, which is I'm going to read from the ending. Because tragically, in this situation, spoilers are a bit redundant. Um, <laughs> spoiler alert, it doesn't end well. Um, and that also means this is somewhat of a misleading reading because I've chosen several sections to put together for a 15-minute reading. And the tone is, uh, I, I think, much more um, elegiac and ruminative than it is in the rest of the book. So in many, many ways, this is a really inappropriate and misleading reading. So I hope you will <laughs> bear with me. But it does also address the ghost in the room of October. That strange book, What is to be Done, casts a long shadow. In 1902, Lenin named his own seminal tract on leftist organization after the novel of 40 years previously. Nikolai Chernyshevsky's story is interspersed with dream sequences. In the most celebrated, the protagonist, Vera Pavlovna, journeys from the ancient past to a strange, affecting, utopian future. The hinge of the dream the fulcrum from history to possibility consists in its entirety of two rows of dots, something ostentatiously unspoken. Behind that ellipsis lay revolution. With such discretion, the author evaded the censor, but there is something almost religious, too, in this unwriting from this atheist son of a priest. Apophatic theology considers God as beyond language, and here is an apophatic revolutionism. In its potential for utter reconfiguring, revolution is beyond words, a messianic interruption, but one that emerges from the quotidian, unsayable, yet the culmination of everyday exhortations. Oh, my love, now I know all your freedoms. I know that it will come, Chernyshevsky has Vera urgently gasp after that wordlessness. But what will it be like? Today, that question can only hurt. Late evening of the 26th of October, 1917, the day after the insurrection, Lenin speaks his first famous words to the Congress of Soviets. We shall now proceed to construct the socialist order. The war is ended, comes a hushed exclamation. The war is ended. Delegates sob. They break, not into celebratory, but funereal song, honoring those who've died in the struggle for this moment. But the war is not yet ended and the order to come will be anything but socialist. For a while, Lenin remains bullish about the prospects for international revolution, long held to be the only context in which the Russian revolution might survive. Germany is in the throes of upheaval. A Soviet government arises in Hungary. Struggle erupts in Austria. Italy sees two red years. But instance by instance, the wave is quelled. The Bolsheviks wake up to their isolation as the situation within their borders, too, becomes desperate. They must fight several counter-revolutionary or white forces backed by foreign powers. By 1919, Russian territory is occupied by American and French, British, Japanese, German, Serbian, and Polish troops. And socialism is more irksome to the Americans and British and French than are their wartime foes. Churchill is particularly obsessed with the foul baboonery of Bolshevism. As the war ends, he declares his intention to kill the Bolshe, kiss the Hun. The Allies screw down an embargo against a starving population. White forces unleash butchery, burning villages, killing tens of thousands of Jews in enthusiastic pogroms, performing exemplary torture. Had they won, not Italian, but Russian would have given the world the word for fascism, Trotsky says. These are months and years of unspeakable barbarity and suffering, starvation, mass death, the near total collapse of industry and culture, of banditry and cannibalism. And the beleaguered regime unleashes its own red terror. And its reach and depth expands beyond control. Some agents of the Cheka, the political police, seduced by personal power, sadism, or the degradation of the moment, are thugs and murderers. Others carry out their work with anguish. One may feel skeptical, even disgusted, at an attempt under desperate necessity at an ethical terror, a terror as limited as possible. But the testimonials of agents tormented at what they believed they had to do are powerful. I have spilt so much blood, I no longer have any right to live, 
says the drunken and distraught Czech ahead Zizinski in 1918. Many of the Soviet regime's leaders struggle to restrain the degrading tendencies of their own terror, of which they are horribly aware. But a political and moral rot is without question setting in. Faced with collapse, the regime rolls back the desperate militarized control known as war communism. From 21 to 27, it encourages some private enterprise, and spivs and wheeler dealers make good on speculation and the burgeoning black market. The country labors through a rubble of industry, agriculture, and the working class itself. The bureaucratic apparatus is suspended now above the remnants of the class for which it claims to speak. Lenin's health is failing. He struggles in what has been called his final fight against the bureaucratic tendencies, the ossification and corruption he sees spreading. He grows suspicious of Stalin's personality, his place in the machine, insists he be removed from his post. His advice is not followed. Lenin dies in January 1924. The most ostentatious element of the grotesque death cult that is launched remains in place today, his gnarled and ghastly corpse receiving obeisance from its catafalque. In 1924, against the protests of Trotsky and others, the party performs a giddying about face, accepting Stalin's claim that, in general, the victory of socialism is unconditionally possible in one country. This is a dramatic reversal of a foundational thesis, a shift born of despair as prospects for international support recede. But if it is utopian to hope that help is around the corner, how much more so is it to wager on the impossible, autarkic socialism? A hard-headed pessimism would be less damaging than this bad hope. Its effects are devastating. As any vestigial culture of debate and democracy withers, Stalin builds up his own power, his own status as most equal of all. Party activists are hounded to betray each other and confess to preposterous crimes with stentorian declarations. They are executed by this counter-revolution against their tradition in that tradition's name. And with this comes a revival of statism and anti-Semitism and nationalism and bleakly reactionary norms in culture, sexuality, family life. Stalinism, a police state of paranoia, cruelty, murder, and kitsch. After a protracted sumerki, the word means both twilight and the darkness before dawn, a long spell of what the poet Osip Mandelstam, remembering the start of 1917, calls liberty's dim light. What might have been a sunrise becomes a sunset. There have been a hundred years of crude, a historical, ignorant, bad faith, and opportunist attacks on October. Without echoing such sneers, we must nonetheless interrogate the revolution. The old regime was vile and violent. Russian liberalism weak and quick to make common cause with reaction. All the same, is the gulag, the telos of 1917? That objective strains face the new regime is clear, and there are subjective factors too, questions we must pose. Nothing is given. But had, say, the internationalists of other groups not walked out on the night of the revolution, a less monolithic and embattled government just might have been an outcome, which is not to exonerate the Bolsheviks for their own mistakes or worse. In January 1923, Lenin rather startlingly allows as incontrovertible that Russia had not been ready for revolution in 1917. But he wonders pugnaciously whether a people influenced by the hopelessness of its situation, could be blamed for flinging itself into a struggle that would offer it at least some chance of securing conditions for the further development of civilization. It is not absurd to argue that the ground down of Russia had no choice but to act on the chance that in doing so, they might alter their situation. But the party's shift after Lenin's death from that plaintive, embattled sense that there had been little alternative but to strive in imperfect conditions to the later bad hope of socialism in one country is a baleful result of recasting necessity as virtue. <laughs>
We see a similar curdling tendency in the depiction of war communism as desiderata rather than desperation, or of censorship, say, as an expression of anything other than weakness. We see it in the traducing and misrepresentation of opponents. Those on the side of the revolution must engage with these failures and crimes. To do otherwise is to fall into apologia and special pleading, hagiography, and to risk repeating mistakes. It is not for nostalgia's sake that the strange story of the first socialist revolution in history deserves celebration. The standard of October declares that things changed once and they might do so again. It brings for an instant a new kind of power, fleetingly a shift towards workers' control of production, the rights of peasants in land, to the land, equal rights for men and women in work and marriage, to divorce, maternity support, the decriminalization of homosexuality a hundred years ago, national self-determination, free universal education, the expansion of literacy and a cultural explosion, a change in the soul as much as in the factory. And though those moments are snuffed out, become bleak jokes and memories all too soon, it might have been otherwise. It might have been different, for these were only the first and most faltering steps. The revolutionaries want a new country in a new world, one they cannot see, but believe they can build. And they believe that in so doing, the builders will build themselves anew. It would be absurd, a ridiculous myopia, to hold up October as a simple lens through which to view today. But it has been a long century, a long dusk of spite and cruelty, the excrescence and essence of its time. Twilight, even remembered twilight is better than no light at all, and it would be equally absurd to say that there is nothing we can learn from the revolution, to deny that the Sumerki of October can be ours and that it need not always be followed by night. The journalist John Reed reports the speech of one anti-revolution politician to his colleagues. It is beneath our dignity to be shot down here in the street by switchmen. Then, what he meant by switchmen, he says, I never discovered. There is a probable answer in an unlikely place. In 1917, the Yiddish writer Chaim Grade was a young child in Lithuania. Much later, in the glossary to the English translation of his memoirs, he describes the switchman's booths along the railroad tracks in the vicinity of Vilna. Before the revolution of 1917, he says, the area around the forest shacks was the clandestine meeting place for the local revolutionaries. It seems that the word switchman was an epithet for revolutionaries. There was a kind of bleak rigor to the dogmas of many who opposed the revolution, including on the left. The epochs, according to their view, must succeed one another per force like stations along a line, and Russia was not ready if it would ever be. Little wonder such thinkers would scorn the Bolsheviks and others as switchmen. What could be more inimical to any trace of teleology than those who take account of the alternate lines of history or who take to them. The revolution of 1917 is a revolution of trains, history proceeding in screams of cold metal. The Tsar's wheeled palace shunted onto sidings forever. Lenin's sealed stateless carriage, trains crisscrossing Russia heavy with desperate deserters. Revolutions, Marx said, are the locomotives of history. Put the locomotive into top gear, Lenin exhorted himself in a private note just weeks after October. Keep it on the rails. But how if there is one true line, one way, and it is blocked? In 1937, Bruno Schultz ruminates dizzyingly on events that have no place of their own in time. The possibility that all the seats within time might have been sold Conductor, where are you? Don't let's get excited. Have you ever heard of parallel streams of time within a two-track time? Yes, there are such branch lines of time, somewhat illegal and suspect. But when, like us, one is burdened with contraband of supernumerary events that cannot be registered, one cannot be too fussy. Let us try to find, at some point of history, such a branch line, a blind track onto which to shunt these illegal events. There is nothing to fear. By the forest shacks are the points, switches onto hidden tracks through wilder history. The question is not only who should be driving the engine, but where. There are those with something to fear, and they police these suspect, illegal branch lines, all the while insisting that they do not exist. 
Onto such tracks, the revolutionaries divert their train with its contraband cargo, unregisterable, supernumerary, powering for a horizon, an edge as far away as ever, and yet careering closer. Or so it looks from the liberated train in liberty's dim light. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm pleased to be here to help celebrate the launch of China's wonderfully engaging narrative of the Russian Revolution in this year, its 100th anniversary. My comments will relate to anniversaries of the revolution and will weave in some of the biography of Alexander Shlopnikov. Anniversaries of some unsuccessful revolutionary events have been used to press continuing grievances against repressive regimes. That was the case with the anniversaries of Bloody Sunday, January 9th, 1905, in Russia, prior to the 1917 revolution, when peaceful petitioners marched on the Tsar's palace and were mown down. These anniversaries were marked with illegal demonstrations, strikes, and other protests. With the Bolsheviks' victory in the Russian Civil War, their revolutionary anniversaries over time became celebrations that reinforced the power of the one-party state. Since the collapse of the USSR, Russia's government has found it difficult to deal with the legacy of 1917. It replaced the holiday marking the Bolshevik seizure of power with a day of national unity celebrated a few days earlier and associated with military victories expelling foreign invaders. The 100th anniversary of the entire revolutionary year of 1917 is complex, for it encompasses events with different meanings for socialists, liberals, nationalists, and conservatives. The memory of these events stirs tension as one considers that in coming years we will meet with the we will meet the 100th anniversaries of Russian Civil War battles, massacres, and pogroms. Indeed, commemoration of the revolution arises out of the 100th anniversary of the conflagration of World War I. In 1927, 10 years after the Russian Revolution, socialist feminist Alexandra Kollontai was Soviet ambassador to Sweden and Norway. She found herself assisting her comrade from the former workers' opposition, Alexander Shlopnikov, in his negotiations of trade agreements with Scandinavian countries for machinery and metals imports to the USSR. As a side note to her business-like advice to him, she reminded him of their romantic stroll in Paris in 1911 when they began an affair that would last into 1916. She remarked that if anyone had told them then that 16 years later they would be corresponding about the quality and price of iron, they simply would not have believed it. By the later years of the new economic policy, revolutionary romanticism seemed to have surrendered to the realities of power in a country desperate for machines and metals to build industry that would help realize the socialist dream. Stalin sought to harness the idealism of a new generation to carry out his own revolution in 1928 to 32, but many of the old Bolsheviks who would perish in his great terror in 1936 to 38 saw Stalin's society as a perverse of their dream. In the 20th anniversary year of the revolution, 1937, Alexander Shlopnikov, like many other old Bolsheviks, was executed, having been convicted falsely of leading an anti-Soviet terrorist organization, the so-called Workers' Opposition. He was cremated and buried in an unmarked grave. His memoir, Histories of the Revolutionary Movement, had been banned already in 1932 and his revolutionary past would be omitted or distorted in Soviet history textbooks for decades to come. His personal documents would be sequestered away in secret archives, his wife arrested, and their children separated and sent to orphanages. Memory of him was suppressed but not erased, however. Kollontai survived the terror. Her diary entries in 1936 and 1938, framing the 20th anniversary year, mourned her innocent friends who were being destroyed and expressed trepidation that she too, though without guilt, might fall a victim. For decades, revolutionary holidays celebrated Stalin's role or that of the party without mentioning individuals who had been disgraced. 
Then came the release of prisoners from the Gulag and the Thal under Nikita Khrushchev. In the 50th anniversary year of the revolution, 1967, historian Edward Burjalov's book, The February 1917 Uprising in Petrograd, was published in the USSR. Burjalov's history crested the wave of a thaw in Soviet historiography, and he restored Shlapnikov's memoirs to their place as valuable sources about the revolutionary year. By the time an English translation of his book was published in 1987, the 70th anniversary year of the Russian Revolution, the Soviet Union was gripped by Gorbachev's policies of glasnost, openness, and perestroika, restructuring, which were necessarily accompanied by the political rehabilitation of Stalin's political rivals and reconsideration of the various alternatives within the Russian Communist Party. By 1997, the 80th anniversary of the revolution, most Russians had abandoned thoughts of alternatives to Stalinism within the communist tradition and instead were struggling to adapt to the unstable and unpredictable economic conditions of the Yeltsin era. Yet at the same time, the opening of former Soviet archives had allowed both Russian and foreign scholars to explore the events of 1917 in ways not possible before, through the eyes of women, peasants, inhabitants of the provinces, minority nationalities, and by publishing documents from the history of non-Bolshevik parties and so forth. Now we have reached 100 years since the Russian Revolution of 1917. Numerous special conferences and panels are being held to mark the anniversary, and books about the revolution have been published, new ones. Some of the topics are old, about workers, sailors, dual power, while others explore new themes like gender, sexuality, and memory. Some focus on the events in Russia, while others look at the revolution's international context and its reverberations not only in Europe, but also in European colonies. Ideological perspectives vary as some conference organizers seek lessons from the Russian Revolution for building a more successful revolutionary socialist movement, while others hope to discover why the liberal institutions formed during the February Revolution failed to take root. Nationalism remains on the scene as well, for one conference looks at 1917 not primarily as the year of a Russian Revolution, but as the first year of Ukraine's short-lived statehood. Not only have conferences been held and books published, but numerous museum exhibits around the world are showcasing artifacts from 1917 during this anniversary year. For example, the State Central Museum of Contemporary History of Russia in Moscow put on display over 1,500 rare October 1917 revolution artifacts, including handwritten notes by Bolshevik leader Vladimir Lenin and a window from the iconic cruiser Avrora. One of the most promising developments during the 100th anniversary year has been the explosion of digitized primary sources about the revolution, which are going online. Russian archives and libraries are digitizing and posting on their websites copies of 1917 documents, newspapers, memoirs, images, and more. All of this should enable students of the revolution to draw meaning from it for decades to come. For all these developments to have an impact, however, the revolution must remain alive and engaging in popular culture. China Mayville's book, October, serves this goal by means of its energetic style, vivid characterizations, and rapid pace. It rekindles the optimistic spirit of the Russian revolutionaries in 1917 before civil war crashed upon the people. Perhaps his book will help rescue the Russian Revolution from its near disappearance in many current history textbooks and in popular awareness. Um, I congratulate him upon the release of his book. Thank you. <laughs> When uh, Wes at Adverso asked me to do this um, event, I was, I was hesitant. Uh, one of the reasons why I was hesitant was because I, I don't get out of the house much, and uh, I do maybe 10 events here a year. So basically like 20% of the time that I go out to a social event, it's to the Verso, Verso Loft. So, so that was one reason, but the other one was, I think the, the Russian Revolution is something where, you know, I, I was very confident in my opinions of it after I read like two books. Um, then I think now, you know, being a socialist for more than a decade, and you know, we, we focus a lot in 1917 and the socialist movement for for good and bad. 
uh, now like 30 books in, I'm you know more uncertain uh, th than ever. And I feel like maybe I'll regain my confidence, but it's going to take 20 more books. Um, but but China's is definitely you know one that I was I was happy to um, to read and is gripping and engaging. Um, now I, I think one of the lessons of the the Bolshevik uh, Revolution is that to begin with, the old cliche stands it started with the best of intentions, and you know that's that's not to kind of recant you know Dante or anything. It's actually because the mainline historiography of the Bolshevik Revolution would deny you know even even that. The alternative to Bolshevik rule was, in the best scenario, some type of uh, dictatorship similar to the right-wing dictatorship you had in, let's say, Poland in the interwar um, you know, period. In the worst case, it was, um, like China you know, alludes to, uh, the, a kind of genocidal, um, you know, anti-Semitic state that I, I think actually would have been quite a bit worse than Italian um, fascism. Um, you know, for one thing, um, there were hundreds of thousands and, and millions of not just socialists, but left social revolutionaries and Mensheviks and Bolsheviks, and you could imagine the type of repression it would have taken to actually crush the worker um, insurgencies that were, were going on. It would be on a scale that would, would have been um, completely unimaginable. Now, you know, where did the Bolsheviks go wrong? There was a large bit of literature that was devoted to essentially a culturalist answer to this question. And it, it boiled down to not just the nature of pre-revolution uh, Russian political uh, culture or its institutions, but in particular to kind of the, like a certain things about the Slavic character and whatnot. Of course, we reject those explanations um, out of hand. There was a much more common and prevalent view a view that was embraced not just by cold warriors, but by uh, Stalinists as well, which was, and of course, the Stalinists wouldn't often call themselves Stalinists, they would call themselves just Leninists, because they were pushing through um, a view that they had in common with these cold warriors, which is a continuity between Lenin and Stalin, a very neat continuity that I think we should reject, but with some, some caveats. For one thing, in these narratives, the Bolshevik party was from the beginning kind of proto-totalitarian. It was a party that had a conspiratorial, it was a professional party, a party of revolutionaries with a conspiratorial view of the world, um, intent on launching a coup and seizing power and making the rest of the world catch up to their, their ideas. Now, in fact, the pre-war Bolshevik party was radically democratic. I mean, one anecdote that I like is that Lenin had a number of Iskra articles rejected. Now, this is something that's even hard to imagine. I'm a member of a very soft and tame kind of pinko organization, the Democratic Socialists of America. And if I, if I even me as like a you know, mid-level cadre in this organization submitted something to our paper and had it rejected, you know, I'd be, I'd be outraged. But Lenin, <laughs> Lenin was not, not only you know, willing to, to go along with this, not only did he lose many political arguments in his day, but in fact, he, on multiple occasions, didn't even have his, his views aired um, in the, the party press. Now, in many ways, Bolshevism wasn't a break with European social democracy. It was an attempt to take the logic of pre-war European social democracy and apply it to Russian conditions, you know, harsh conditions, conditions of illegality, um, and so on. And in many ways, it was the Bolsheviks that remained true to social democracy even after the mainstream of social democracy had betrayed its ideals by, in, in the mainstay, going, with, um, going along with um, imperialist war. So essentially, the right of social democracy, you know, we don't have to moralize it about it. They weren't bad people who betrayed an idea just because of personal opportunism or greed or whatnot. There was a certain logic to what the right uh, pre-war social democracy did. They saw that the workers' movement gained when capitalism was stable and profitable. They saw that they gained more ability to win things for these workers that they represented. And of course, they had a mass base. They had the bulk, at least in Germany, of the trade unions behind them and whatnot, when they had a certain degree of power and legitimacy. 
And this legitimacy, in part, came from not just their popular support, but from legitimacy within bourgeois stratas, within the state, and whatnot. And they decided then, therefore, when capitalism is unstable, we stabilized. And therefore, when you know, the, the national interest is at stake, we show that we can prove ourselves to be worthy inheritors of power in the natural um, instincts. This was the logic of the right. And it's a logic that, again, we could disagree with politically, but it's coherent. The logic of the left was to see this situation and essentially call for a break, call with, for, for rupture. So in other words, if capitalism was prone to crisis and unstable, and in the long run, there would be all this pulls to prevent a kind of break with capitalism. When the moment strikes, we must take advantage of it. Otherwise, we end up kind of dealing with who knows how many contradictions of capitalism over and over again. This war, we shouldn't forget, killed 16 million people. The scale of the, the disaster of, of, of the Great War can't be understated. So the left of Luxembourg, of Lenin, and often they're separated in literature, but, but in, in kind of reality, they were very close. And in many ways, you know, Lenin's view on national liberation and so on were, were actually quite a bit uh, softer and more enlightened um, than, than Luxembourg. And I say that only because in a certain uh, uh, type of um, literature, you, you know, Luxembourg and Gramsci are, 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 are kept as kind of the heroes and Lenin is, is isolated and vilified, but in fact they showed far more commonalities and difference. The center of social democracy, you know, my own tradition, um, was in a contradictory place. Um, it basically advocated rhetorically for the politics of a break, a politics of a rupture, but in practice were, was unable to break with the day-to-day -day practice of the, the right wing of social democracy. But this was the condition um, before, um, um, before the Russian Revolution. Um, there was no kind of special Leninist um, kind of professional rev revolutionary cadre intent on a coup that was violating the norms of European social democracy. These debates were very much in line with what were happening elsewhere, um, I adjusted for one, the tactical and strategic genius of Lenin and the Bolshevik party actually succeeding where others failed, um, and also um, you know, the fact they were operating under the, the most reactionary uh, regime in, in Europe. Now, where I think we can condemn or question the Bolsheviks is not their attempt at October, is not their, their revolution, which did have, especially after the August coup, a great degree of legitimacy. But the fact that even before the start of the Civil War, they had started to, like China says in his, his epilogue, in his, in his um, discussion, make a virtue out of necessity. Um, the secret police in Russia was started about a month, a little bit less than a month and a half um, before the, um, the start of the, the Civil War. Um, Essentially, I think a lot of the problems with the Bolsheviks in power is that they lacked a theory of politics. You'd, well, at the one hand, the slogan that helped usher them to power was all power to the Soviets. The actual Soviets themselves had different overlapping jurisdictions. There was all these kind of contradictions in place. Socialists weren't thinking about what a socialist politics of, of what jurisprudence would look like under socialism and whatnot. And these seemed like trivial things, and in opposition it often seems like a trivial thing, but they begin to matter um, very, very quickly. Lenin himself embraced in the early years a kind of red Jackmanism. Um, and it's telling, I think, that Lenin looked favorably, more, far more favorably than Luxembourg and Trotsky and others to the, um, to the French uh, revolutionaries than, um, than Marxists traditionally did. Um, and this was most telling because of his favorance of things like collective punishment. So not only would you be responsible for your crime, but your family would as well. And this kind of change rhetorically, at least, to collective responsibility for certain social classes. Um, so there's a famous quote by one of the, the de deputy uh, commissars of the um, uh, of deputy chairs of the Ukrainian um, secret police at the time in 1918, which goes something like, um, you know, we don't judge people based on what they do necessarily so much as their guilt is determined by which social, social strata, strata they come from. Um, and I, so I, think, I think beyond that, though, 
the tragedy of the Russian Revolution was also the belief that, you know, the kind of economic failures and, and difficulties that Russia was experiencing was solely due to sabotage, due to kind of grain supplies being stolen or because of speculation or manipulation um, and, and whatnot. So there was assumption then in the immediate stage of the war is that some type of kind of collective new forms of agriculture, mind you, they wouldn't be forced collectivization, they'd be voluntary, would naturally outcompete um, smallholder peasant agriculture. Now, if you find, and you could either say this is something kind of more deeply rooted, or you could say this is kind of an accident of, um, of a particular, uh, you know, objective conditions that Russia was in, that the smallholder, um, you know, peasant um, agriculture was in fact more efficient, either you build your, your economic system around it, either you adjust for it, like the, I think cer um, certain aspects of the NEP did, or you have to deal with some level of, of coercion. Now, that isn't to say, of course, that Stalin, you know, uh, was a natural outgrowth of Lenin. The excesses of Stalinism were extreme. Um, Stalinism sought not just to control a country's political and economic life, but control over the arts, culture, um, and things like, like that. Now, then, you know, the real question is, were the Bolsheviks wrong to make their revolution? Were they wrong in the mistakes they made? To some degree, you could say that Lenin made a virtue of necessity, made mistakes, but this was the very first experiment at socialist governance. Um, socialist democracy was eroded over time, but it was still something that even the Bolsheviks during the war communist uh, for, um, period were, you know, referring to. Now, if you actually read, you know, books like ABCs of, of Communism, there's, there's, it's filled with caveats saying, of course it shouldn't actually be like this, of course it's a short-term necessity, and so on. You know, it was filled with these caveats and, and hesitations. The crime that Leninism became when it mutated in a Stalinist form was that every single other experience of worker-led government, be it um, in the Third World, be it in the Eastern Bloc and elsewhere, um, never even started from the starting point of saying, we're going to create socialist democracy, and then maybe things will degenerate as we hit roadblocks. It, it truly took what this system became by the late 1920s and early 1930s um, as a model for, for governance. And increasingly, and this, this is something that, that should be said against, against Lenin, increasingly these compromises were, were just saying, oh, this is just socialism. Workers control, that's just control particular workers at a factory council. That's not control of, of a class, and we're about class control and whatnot. So, you know, essentially, what do we take away um, from all this? I think it's key that we remember 100 years after the October Revolution, at a time that's going to be filled with the recriminations about what the Bolsheviks did wrong, what happened wrong, was the unseen or untalked about crime of Tsarism that lasted for, for centuries, the crimes of serfdom that came with it, of poverty and disorder, and the immediate crime of the Great War that put 60 million soldiers into battle, that produced arms and weapons at a time when people were starving, and the bourgeoisie continually say, said to people, there's not enough, there's not enough for you to live decently, there's not enough for you to, to, um, to have clothes and, and basic necessities, but there's enough to create armaments to kill 16 million people. These were the conditions the Bolsheviks made their revolution, decided to break from capitalism, and it was with the idea that these periodic crises would happen more and more often now, where does that leave us today in the West, 100 years after? Now, me, I'm just a soft left social democrat of sorts. You know, I think in many ways, we have a lot to also learn from the experiences of you know, Sweden in the 1970s, the left wing of social democracy that, that encountered certain contradictions of a certain form of socialism and tried to go beyond it and failed. But I, th I think one thing we, we can learn is that the actual idea that Lenin embarked on when he went to Finland Station, the idea of breaking with capitalism, of creating a better world, of, of getting rid of um, class society and the, the suffering amid abundance we have today, was correct. And in a way, we need to return to Finland Station, but with more caution and maybe a little bit less hubris than before, 
And luckily, you know, I think we, we have a, a bit better conditions to do so than they did in a country with mass illiteracy, with the working class was maybe like 5% of the population and so on. Uh, that was where I was going to end it. I realize it's a pretty bad, bad note to end on. Um, but you should read China's book. It's excellent. That's it. <laughs> Okay. So, yes. I think we have like what 25 minutes, 20 minutes or something. Okay. Will you give us a wave when we've got time for like one more or something? So if anyone wants to chip in or ask any questions or anything. Is there going to be a? Yeah, we have two mics. Um, So we'll have two mics on each side. Try to keep your questions to questions. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Andy will be taking that side, and I'll handle over here. Um, if you're able to, try to come to the front. If I call on you, um, if not, I can come to you. But if I could see some hands, that'd be good. Hi, um, thank you for um, your book. I uh, started reading it earlier this week, and um, what I found great about it is that it had a kind of historical narrative style similar to C.L.R. James um, in The Black Jacobins, where you're immersed in um, the kind of everyday events and the contours and landscape of a revolution. Um, but what I think is different is the prehistory that's provided. Um, and something I kind of wanted to ask about is um, particularly the role that ethnic and religious minorities played in uh, Marxist uh, organizing and parties, particularly uh, uh, Jewish Russians, who under the uh, czarist regime were very much oppressed, but then also vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Marxist reading circles and other forms of organizing were able to be um, uh, militant and tenacious uh, leaders. Um, and then outside of that, um, there's a point in uh, uh, one of the chapters, there's some kind of Muslim Congress where um, uh, Muslim uh, people who were part of the, the Soviet and Russia had a Congress in which they demanded and talked about uh, religious oppression, and that in one of those Congresses, there was like 25% of it was women, and they said, if we aren't granted rights, we'll seize them. Um, and I think that's, that's something that's often left out of the history of, uh, of militant, uh, politically involved and sharp uh, religious minorities, both Jewish and uh, Muslim, who were participating actively in um, uh, the uh, Russian and Marxist circles. And I wanted to um, know uh, to what extent um, others have have spoken on that and why, um, why you thought that was the case that they were, had such an active role? Um, well, first of all, I, um, to be compared to CLR James is, is mind-blowingly wonderful praise, so thank you. Um, uh, Black Jacobin's a huge book for me. Um, in terms of the, to address the ethnicity, I mean, this is something I think Barbara would know more about than me, but um, it's quite true that uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the ethnic minorities within the empire were always overrepresented in the revolutionary movement. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, you had obviously the, the, there was the, the, the Bund, which was a specifically Jewish party, but for the most part, within the other parties, within the radical parties, not by any means just the Bolsheviks, um, uh, 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 minorities were um, somewhat overrepresented. Um, one of the great um, like most horrifying, uh, sort of symbolically horrifying tragedies, I think of the of the post of of of, of the collapse that came after is the the transmission belt whereby those aspects of um, uh, of Bolshevism about which a certain amount of nostalgia, semi-official nostalgia, is allowed in Russia is 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 essentially great Russian chauvinism. So around Putin's clique, Lenin is persona non grata, but there are th those who think Stalin, because he was kind of a, you know, a great uh, a Russian chauvinist, ironically given his own background, but, um, so yes, I, and, and in the, in the I, I deliberately, again, in conjunction with the editor, I deliberately didn't include like the full reading list and the full bibliography in this, because it isn't a scholarly book, doesn't pretend to be, it's a, you know, um, I, a little part of me slightly regret, regrets not putting a a link and then putting the full bibliography online because I read a lot of books and I want some kudos for this, you know. So, um, um, but, but 
there, are, there, is a, there is a further reading section, and there's a couple of books in that which I think address the, thing, the, the things you're talking about very directly. There's been a series, Slavica have just been putting out a series of amazing books on the revolution centenary, and there's, they deal with this quite a lot. The question of, you mentioned the, the Muslim Congress, and there were two. There was a, an all-women Congress uh, earlier in the year, and then there was the Muslim Soviet. Um, I mean... The, I was able to find one article on the, on the Women's Congress, um, and this is because of the, the generosity of scholars like Barbara, who uh, you know, I was kind of crowdsourcing for, um, for, for references, and I've tried to, and that again is included, there's a few references to this, but um, there is, I think, a danger in, uh, because of, I think, in part, the kind of crushing uh, weight of decades of this kind of sneering right-wing common sense about the aspirations for emancipation, that telling straightforward stories about what happened there is somehow being dewy-eyed, you know? So you read this, the, you know, these eyewitness testimony of exactly the, the anecdote you're talking about, a young woman activist, like super young, I think she was 24 or something, you know, from this kind of incredibly patriarchal society and this incredibly uh, backward empire, standing up in the middle of this revolutionary year, absolutely explicitly fired up by uh, the, the overturning of every norm. And when this, you know, what this man is, this, uh, man is sort of debating about whether or not we should give rights to women, and she stands up in the middle of the Congress and says, you know, you don't give them to us, we take them. And somehow we're at a point where we say that, we tell that fact, and there's a kind of, oh, here we go again with the nostalgia. It's like, no, that happened. That happened, and that cannot be disaggregated from this year. So, um, I mean, yes, there's the, the, that, that presence is, uh, is, is, is very, very vibrant throughout the year. And, and within the constraints of a necessarily limited book, I tried constantly to kind of uh, draw attention to the fact that this was not a Petrograd-only phenomenon. It certainly wasn't a, an ethnically Russian-only phenomenon. So, yeah. Did you have anything you wanted to? I don't want to okay. <laughs> but yes, the, the level of national identity formation did vary across the Russian Empire, and it was stronger among the nationalities of the western part of the Russian Empire, Poles, Finns, Jews, uh, Western Ukrainians, and then in Central Asia, um, the, the reformers were trying to form a pan-Turkic identity more so than a Kazakh or Uzbek nationality and the liberation of women, the emancipation of women was, was part of the modernization that when the Bolsheviks began to carry it out was far more abrupt and jarring uh, in the context of the traditions uh, than, than perhaps the liberal reformers and pan-Turkic reformers had in mind. I'll just stop. Is it on? Oh, there we go. All right. I wanted to know if uh, doing the research for the book and current events in the U.S. and the U.K. and in Russia made you at all think about or reevaluate your ideas about how much words and stated intentions and debate and the sort of lefty and intellectual tradition and trust in words really matters, uh, especially to the other side. Um, yeah. That's an, that's an incredibly fascinating question, and it does touch directly on stuff I've been thinking about, although I suspect maybe not quite in the ways that you, that you mean, although I, I may be wrong. I mean, um, I th forgive me if I'm not quite addressing what you're, what you're talking about, but I think, I mean, one of, one of the things that uh, comes through, not just in this story for me, but in any reading about any political story, any big political events, is that getting bogged down in, you know, what people really thought, scare quotes, becomes very unhelpful because consciousness is incredibly fluid. One can convince oneself of all kinds of things. So the idea of, like, the, you know, if we can just have a good faith debate, at least we're talking the same language kind of thing. Um, so t on one level, it's simply about saying there was literally nothing anyone could say at, at certain points of this year that their opponents would not find perfidy in. And if that's one of the things you're insinuating, I, I, I completely agree. My go-to example about this, by the way, is uh, the Iraq war. There's, there, there, there is still a debate among some British liberals about, you know, uh, well, you know, Tony Blair genuinely believed that there were weapons of mass destruction, right? And, you know, I, I, I think this is 
profoundly useless way of thinking about it. I mean, A, I, I, you know, like in my, in, my, in my sort of more particularly bitter moments, I think, no, he didn't. But then a lot of the time I think, look, you know, he's a messianic guy. He believes himself to be, you know, the, the sort of guiding hand of history. It's perfectly possible that he convinced himself of the necessity of that belief and then convinced himself it was true. I don't give a shit. It's not the point. That's not how you make the judgment. That's why the good faith doesn't matter. So on that level of like the inability to have, because you can't have a good faith argument with someone who is implacably opposed to your political ontology, it can't be done. Um, what this opens up, though, is another, another sort of an adjunct to your question, which is what I touched on in there about this idea of an apophatic revolutionism. And there are certain political metaphors that recur for me. I don't think that political that metaphors are a sort of uh, a kind of nice to have and also ran. They're just like a kind of a little uh, a little tweak in detail that that that, that are fun. Like I think. As long as you don't mistake them for kind of scientific rigor, for me, one of the reasons I, I love metaphors and political metaphors is that they become illuminating. They actually help me understand the world better. So to take, for example, the kind of train metaphor, like it was a very organizing metaphor for me all the way through. You look at someone, this was a point Esther Leslie, the um, uh, activist and professor made, which you look at someone like Walter Benjamin, he's talking about revolution as putting on the brake, as like the train not going any further. The fact that you have totally contradictory metaphors doesn't alter the fact that they can both be illuminating for political heuristics. And the one that I keep coming back to is apophysis, is the unspeakable, the unsayable in revolution. And it recur it's not just my invention, it recurs throughout this year, these like holes in language. So uh, I would go, there's a, there's a beautiful metaphor halfway through the year where the Bolsheviks are being completely wrong-footed on all sides by the kind of pace of events. And in a desperate moment at the, at the end of the, like in the small hours, they pull because they realized the instructions they'd printed on their, on their paper, no one was gonna pay attention to. They didn't wanna look stupid, so they pulled it, so the paper came out with a blank hole in the middle of its front page, which is the most pregnant metaphor for ap apophatic revolutionism I can, I can possibly think. And for me, it's not just a question of the kind of the unsayable between enemies, it's a question of the kind of the, the beyond sayable, the, the surplus, uh, the beyond language embedded and impregnated in the revolutionary urge itself, which is to me cons part, not, not solely constitutive, but absolutely constitutive of that, of that apocalyptic tradition in which this unabashedly for me stands and should stand. By the, um, do jump in if I, I'm just, uh, okay. sorry, I'm just saying, uh, yeah. <laughs> When discussing the great difficulties the Bolsheviks and Lenin faced in the early days, why is there such little focus on the contribution of the Western imperialists, Americans, French, British, in assisting the whites in not overthrowing the Bolsheviks. Why is I believe so Isaac Deutscher is one historian that did focus on that, as I recall, that the contribution of the whites with the help of the Americans, the Brits, made, were a major force in, you know, in not assisting or helping the Bolsheviks fail. Uh, I mean, I... Uh, Again, I, I, um, I think part of the reason there's a focus on it is because I honestly think it's extremely important. I mean, I think that, you know, the, the um, not just financial and, you know, uh, economically, but also sort of ideological and sort of nebulously cultural support for the, you know, the most... Uh, vicious aspects of murderous counter-revolution by the Allies was, was, was extremely important. In, in the reading, I cut out some of the quotes. There are these amazing quotes from, from us, you know, from the Americans, from the Brits, talking about describing these, <laughs> you know, mass butchers as, quote, tolerably severe. That's one of my, you know, one of my go-to quotes. Um, so I think I think I think that we would underestimate our peril. The uh, you know, and then you've got the kind of the the, um, the 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 blockade and so on and so forth. So I think for me, I, I think we would underestimate our peril. Not just the kind of immediate military, but kind of global and geopolitical, cultural um, uh, constraints that that placed. However, where I I do think sometimes there has been a tradition on the um, on some of the the more kitsch elements of the radical left to 
to essentially say that and then end the conversation and to say, well, you know, it, because, because of the whites, because of the blockade, because of the allies, ergo, revolution failed. And that, I think, I would stand with, you know, the, 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 the sort of dissenting Bolshevik tradition, people like Victor Serge, who were much more unflinching about saying, absolutely, of course, we start with these, you know, brutal and conditions not of our choosing. However, that absolutely does not mean, as I was trying to get at in the thing, that we don't also interrogate the things that are done and the, the, the virtues made of necessity, that, you know, um, under, under these conditions. Um, so I suppose, uh, for me, th th those, those external conditions are the kind of constraining culture, but then within that, uh, certain aspects of the, of, of, of the Bolshevik tradition, um, or, or I shouldn't say the Bolshevik tradition, because as, as Barbara's work and other work points out so much, there were, there were, dis, there were, there were disputatious Bolshevik traditions, um, but certainly the, the, the kind of, if you like, the ones that became mainstream um, had, a, had, a very, had, had a very baleful um, effect of, of, uh, of, of kind of legitimating what should, if exercised, only ever be explicitly understood as catastrophic necessities. I will say that I think that there's something very unconvincing about all this. Like one of the tragedies of socialism in one country is to me is how it reads to me like a kind of, like an expression of panic. Like this notion that like, you know, we, we, you know, we can actually have socialism in one country. There's something about the declaration in the, in, in the aftermath of years of saying the exact opposite, which is kind of, pathetically unconvincing. And I think this, for me, I don't want to be too glib about analogies, but I have, uh, among other people, for a long time been really um, disgusted and horrified by uh, the, 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 the kind of allergy to a kind of facing up to the bleakness of political situations on the left. And this is why I talk about that as bad hope, that I think that kind of, I think there are situations in which you have a, a really bad, there was no good way out in Russia in 1924. There was no, you know, you don't get to save the revolution by making a single choice. But the least bad option is to say, given that everything is really, really bad, here's maybe the least bad things we can do. Um, and. That's not great, but it's better than the bad hope, than the unconvincing, strained, panicked optimism that that was expressed, I, I, I think. Hi, uh, thank you again so much for that beautiful reading and for the book as a whole. Um, this uh, year and this sort of era was such a fruitful time for science fiction in Russia and for, in, you know, across Europe as well. Um, and I was curious if in researching this you sort of found any parallels in yourself of, of a sort of a political or social need for science fiction, for fiction in general, if you found any parallels in your own work to uh, maybe the utopia that you brought up in, in this one or in any of the science fiction that era generated. Um, it's it's an interesting question, actually. My interest in um, in in like Russian science fiction and particularly science fiction early on uh, predates this book by by many years. It's it's a passing. It's an amateur interest. I'm not by any means you know super well read in it, and I don't read Russian, so it's all translation. Um, but I, I do have an interest in it, um, and I think for me. I'm probably the worst person to talk about the, the relations with, with the fiction that I write, but my, my sense is that, you know, one of the kind of shared threads of interest in the science fiction tradition and, uh, uh, and, and, and these events, without being too tendentious, is precisely this sense of apocalypse and this sense of um, not just apocalypse, but also the, um, the sublime and the sense of uh, uh, that, that, that kind of uh, the, the glimmer of otherness much more so than, you know, I'm, I'm very uninterested in blueprints, I'm very uninterested in sort of programmatic utopias, you know, first we will do this, then we will do this. I'm very interested in utopias that break down, I'm very interested in books that seem to escape the control of their own writers. So the, 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 the big example for me would be um, Red Star, Bogdanov's uh, great Russian, well, great question mark, uh, Russian science fiction novel, uh, and the sequel. The interesting thing, are you a fan, by the way, of you, you, you must have read, I mean, you, do you like the book? Now you're putting me on the spot. Uh, sorry, okay, yeah, we consider your answer, yeah. Yeah, but that, but that response is actually really appropriate. I think, I think it's a book that, like, for me, you know, you say, do you like it? It's like, ha. Huh. Um, because as a sort of depiction of a, you know, of a, of a utopian socialist society, it's, 
drab and slightly uh, something kind of weirdly deadening and not very convincing to me and feels politically unhelpful and bad fiction. However, <laughs> however, <laughs> however, um, there are moments of that book that start to get very interesting to me. Specifically, two things that come to mind. One is um, the, the strange, genuinely engaged, elegiac, respect and awe with which the thinly veiled Bogdanov fight narratorial voice starts, starts to describe the radical capitalists in Marx's in, in Mars's history, the kind of the heroic bourgeoisie of yore, like back when there is this kind of yearning for when you actually had a proper liberalism, when you actually had proper bourgeoisie that weren't these stunted and you know embittered, you know pathetic rat-like figures that that we had in actually existing Russia, and something about that weird kind of political nostalgia um, is th there's a hint of that in something Shliapnikov actually said a, a couple of years after the revolution where he's, he talks about with this kind of angry tone about how the capitalists have rejected the historic role they were given in developing the I can't remember the exact quote but he there's a sense of affrontedness about them not doing their job sometimes and the other bit in that in that book that I really like is the bit where I, I haven't read it for years so I'm going to get the details wrong but where the the the, the character who the the main character essentially kind of goes off piste and goes kind of a bit m sort of mad and breaks out of this utopian social society because he can't live in it. And you can read it, you can read that partly as the impossibility of being a socialist political subject in a socialism that you have not either been born to or helped to create. You cannot just plunk, this is about the kind of unthinkable surplus of, of, of radical change. Or you can think about something really interesting about a utopia that escapes the hands of the, of the, of the utopian writer attempting to, to create it. So, so yes, I love that tradition, but often in a kind of conflict, conflictual way. What do you think the prospects of the Russian Revolution would have been had Lenin's ideas spread into Europe before the First World War? There was there were left currents in social democracy that were beginning to form. They weren't organized, but they had some influence. Would it not have made a difference to the outcome had revolutionaries not organized inside social democracy against the growing conservatism? Uh, that is before World War I. I'm going to hand over to Baskar on this uh, as the social democrat. I mean, I, I, let, me, let, me say, let me say um, there's a difficulty here for me, which is that, for one thing, the, uh, um, the, the, the idea of like Lenin's ideas, that they, they were, a, they were a, a fluid thing. And not only were they a, a thing that changed, they particularly changed in the context of the war. And therefore, it's very hard to think in terms of, you know, which, what specifically are we talking about if you do a counterfactual before the war? That's, that's a way of, of, um, of, of thinking, like, I, I'm uh, of kind of ducking the question slightly. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, the short answer is yes, I think they would have done, but um, it involves, you know, the more counterfactuals you posit, the harder it gets to be rigorous about that. And because I find it very difficult to imagine the Russian Revolution or the particular shape of Russian Bolshevism without the war, it's extraordinarily, which I think was, you know, incomparably vital to this story. It's very, very hard for me. I'm sorry, I'm just going to have to kind of hold up my hands and say I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know either. Uh, I, I, would say, I would say that there, there were left currents, I mean, especially after you know, currents advocating for the general strike and all this discussion around these different tactics, but it's easy to go back um, and say there was a left, right, and center. Well, at the time, it was, it was more fluid. Like, Lenin uh, had, you know, thought The Road to Power, which I think was written in 1909 by Kotsky, was an excellent book. And right now, we could reread it, and we could say, okay, this has the seeds of a lot of his later politics, right? It was excessively kind of parliamentaristic, and it had all these other kind of flaws, but they weren't really perceived at the time. And um, so, so in many ways, I think that the, bet the betrayal of European social democracy came as a tremendous shock to people like Lenin, partially because uh, 
the you know, so-called, and again, it's very hard to kind of separate it this neatly, but the center of social democracy uh, was perceived by a lot of people who are on the left of social democracy to be at least intellectually the left of social democracy. Yes, sure, but, our, but at least until 1913 and 14. But again, when we look back, it seems like there's a tremendous difference between like 1917 and 1918 and 1919. But I mean, imagine you having debates with your, your comrades or friends like two years ago. I mean, and, and kind of you know, extrapolating. I mean, this, this is a matter of, 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 of months that these debates took place and you know, they didn't have the internet. We have time for about three more questions. One. Uh, can you guys hear me? Okay. Can everybody else? So, um, as you've written speculative fiction where there are these moments that you describe in the epilogue so well, there are these three points where there are critical moments where things where it's possible for her all to actually be to the real social change. But at the end of those books, like the previous conversation or the city of the city, Well, the, the interesting, I, for me, the interesting part of that question is the phrase, the near future. Um, you know, are there opportunities in the near future, like next week, I doubt. Um, um, but, the, I mean, yes, I do. If I, if I didn't, I would be, um, you know, my, my, my I, am, I am very politically pessimistic at the moment because I think that the situation is, uh, I'm, you know, I'm 44 years old and I do not think I've seen, um, and I've been politically active in certain, in various ways for, 30 years, and I don't think I have seen anything like as utterly toxic and frightening a moment. Um, so I'm very politically pessimistic, and I think that it's important to be pessimistic um, because, you know, otherwise you're going to burn yourself out with bad hope. That said, if I was, if you like, fundamentally pessimistic, if I, if I thought that the, si the situation was, you know, uh, was that things that nothing fundamentally nothing could change that a kind of radical change was impossible then i wouldn't have the politics i have um and the uh, the paradox for me is that the more kind of baleful i feel things are and the more kind of immediately politically pessimistic i feel i also have been more activist and more engaged in the last few years than i have for a long time so and one of the keys about this is that things things change on a dime. They change really, really fast, like to degrees that are constantly giddying. And somehow it's a lesson that we never seem to learn as humans, which is that, you know, think when sometimes things change incredibly quickly. So, which is why it's very difficult and I think unhelpful to think in terms of, well, you know, given the state of the world at the moment, if we get a little bit better and a little bit better, maybe we'll be due for radical social change in 15 years. It just doesn't work that way. It might not change, not change, not change, not change for 20 years and then abruptly change, or three years. Who knows? You know what I mean? Um, the fundamental question is, and I honestly don't know the extent to which this divides you and me. I genuinely don't know this. The fundamental question is the scale of change, not just that you want, but that you believe is possible. Possible, not, ne not likely. Let's be very clear. You know, I, I, you know, if I was asked to kind of put down money on, you know, seeing out my life with that, you know, whether or not there would be fundamental radical social change, the ushering in of a different kind of society in my lifetime, you know, I, I wouldn't give good odds on that. But I don't think it's impossible. And... Um, and I don't think it's, and I think it's what we deserve. And therefore, um, you know, that there's only really one course left open. Um, so, so yes, I absolutely do. And I, and I also hold out a hope. You know, I mean, I'm sorry, to, again, sorry to be glib, you know, but we live right now in an epoch, not only a, a terrible epoch, but one of the few good things about this epoch, I think, is that the era of the political know-it-all is over. 
the algorithms are broken. They don't work. The last four years, you know, you, I've had this kind of nasty, snarky fun looking at all these articles over the last years that are kind of, you know, from, from very smart, very well-read, often, you know, leftist commentators sort of saying, okay, everyone calm down. There's absolutely no way Trump can get the president, can get the candidacy. There's absolutely, everyone calm down. He can't win the thing, you know. And then conversely, you know, let's not be silly. Corbyn is not going to be the leader of the Labour Party, you know. Um, it, Things are broken. Like we have to rethink. We have to rethink the way we think. And one of the things that, that's going on at the moment is that, um, you know, things are shifting very fast, very hard, mostly badly, but not necessarily. Corbyn was an amazing thing, and no matter what happens, because the chances against him are really bad, but but he has had a serious, important, and progressive effect on the agenda, the political agenda in the UK at the moment. Um, you know. Um, that, it's absolutely can be rowed back. There's nothing complacent about that. But, but yes, I do think there can be change. Yeah. Do we disagree on that? No, I, of course I. No, no, yeah. fundamental. I'm but, not but talking about Scandinavia. I'm not talking about Sweden in the 1970s. I believe in you know socialism. I believe there can be worker control of, of production. What, what I you know I, what I do believe is like I'm not a communist, right? I do believe there will always be a state. Uh, the state will look a lot different, but, you know, so in other words, and, and also to some degree, I, I do think that, you know, not to be a Burkean, but I do think that, you know, failed revolutions have consequences, and the tyrannies that could emerge in the aftermath of a failed revolution can be worse than the tyrannies that came before. So I would say that we just need to have a theory of politics that says that politics doesn't end when you expropriate the bourgeoisie. Politics continues, and that's why we always need uh, free civil society. That's why we always need, because, you know, me and you today, right afterwards, we could have a few more beers, gather the rest of the people in this room, and we could start our, a monarchist party. You know, you know, capital wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be, be threatened. I think in such a way, you know, 20, 30 years into social society, um, you know, I wouldn't mind uh, people starting a party to restore capitalism, because I think it would be considered, if we're doing our job right, uh, if the society is functioning, an absurd, ridiculous idea, you know, to bring back the law of the, the desert into a new land of, you know, abundance. You got, you got to have the last word, though. You got to say, you know, say something. <laughs> we'll say something to the next question. Okay. <laughs> uh, two more questions. So, there's one right there. Uh, hi. So, I was in a study group about the Russian Revolution a week ago. And uh, I was wondering if you guys could take up this question that we didn't really get to. Um, so my question is, uh, do you think, and this is to any of you or all three, that the degeneration of the revolution uh, was inevitable given the conditions, um, you know, during the, after the, the Civil War, um, you know, the embargoes, the 20s, the 30s, like, had there not been an autocratic figure like Stalin who came in, um, do you think Russia, like, would have been able to kind of salvage the revolution and make, um, you know, a relatively decent socialist state? Or was that kind of, um, their like, was the isolation that they had, um, like, did that make it inevitable that they would degenerate into this, like, autocratic failed socialist state? Um, I think, honestly, I think it's extremely difficult to imagine, as I was trying to say, like with, with the failure of, the, of, 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 of revolution in Europe, it becomes, and it's not just me thinking this, it's, it's the Bolsheviks and their comrades up to 1924. So, so the, question ha the question in a way is, what circa 1924, when you realize that there aren't going to be, you know, that Germany is not going to become a revolutionary state, and so on, what do you do then? Um, when I made the point at a different meeting about the bad hope of, um, of, of socialism in one country, the, my interlocutor, Owen Hatherley, pointed out, I think quite rightly, that there was also a kind of utopianism to some of the sort of, to Trotsky's position about, you know, if you kind of just hang on in there and the revolution in Europe will happen, you know. Now, that's to be extremely unfair to Trotsky, to put it that way, but uh, there was certainly nothing, you know, it, it was not only not given, but extremely unlikely at that point. I think, I think, I mean, I, I think basically, absent some way of pushing, um, uh, and this wouldn't have been impossible with a different set of politics and international politics. That's what's very important here. Absent some way 
of, of trying to kind of push for social change, revolutionary social change beyond the borders of Russia. I think it, I think that uh, the, the project was, was untenable. And so the question then becomes, if you still want to try for the project, how do you do that? And that's a much, that's a very, a, a separate and bigger debate. Um, I, even however, if you, if you reach the point where you, where you think, well, we can't, it's not gonna work internationally and, you know, uh, there were other, th you know, it, it, what was not inevitable was, you know, the, the, the despotism that grew. If you like, if you have, if you, if you end up with a politics of sort of managed political decline, you realize that your project is not working and, and essentially your job is to kind of ameliorate that as best as possible into the least bad possible outcome, then I think the least bad possible outcome would have been considerably less bad than the outcome that happened. So there's a kind of very, very faint but not wholly impossible internationalist gamble. And then there's a kind of more pessimistic, but less horrendous than actually happened, uh, uh, fa fa surrender, if you like, I, I guess would be my, 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 my thoughts. Great, one more question. Hi. Uh, b based on a, a synthesis of the last question and the preceding one, do you think there are any particularly applicable comparisons or lessons that the American, I guess in particular, left can learn from the Bolshevik Revolution and, yeah. and uh, ha how to not uh, doom ourselves and our own movement heading into the future? I would say two things. I think, um, and I would talk about Britain too here. I mean, for me, I think there are two, uh, because I really, I really don't want to do pat analogies. Like you know, I, I think that's been the absolute bane of a lot of kind of leftism. I don't want to do that. So there are two kind of slightly more abstract analogies. One, you know, history gets better and history gets worse. Take apocalypse seriously. You know, that sense that we are now living in a particularly terrible time. You read the letters of 1917. These sense of kind of something shutting, something nearly opening then shutting, that, that's real. And I think that takes, you know, that, that sense of apocalypse now is, it's not, you know, it, it, is, a, it, is, it is a non, a not unmeaningful political phenomenon, I think. More concretely, um, one of the key things that comes up again and again in, in the revolution is that Russian liberalism uh, at a time of crisis as an, as an institution, as a movement, as a, as a group, as a, uh, as a political ideal, will choose reaction rather than change. It may, some, some, of its, uh, some of its avatars will do so with a, with, with a tear in their eye. Some of them will do so with a kind of sadistic um, grin. But it will choose reaction, including brutal and bloody reaction. Now, I want to be clear. There are, I think... Individual, there are certainly people for whom that's not true, liberals who, for whom that's not true. I'm not talking about every single liberal. I'm talking about as a kind of political current. Um, and I think that follows through not just with Russia but to uh, political history in general. It is slightly terrifying the extent to which that is the case. My friend and comrade and salvage editor, Richard Seymour, uh, made a remark in passing some years ago, which I return to a lot on this, on this topic. And he said, it was in the context of a general discussion, he said there are two kinds of liberals, liberals as opposed to leftists, two kinds of liberals. There are liberals who are liberal because they have fidelity to liberal ideals, and there are liberals who are liberals because they have fidelity to the liberal state. Now, some of the former group can be great activists, can, because one of the things about actually existing liberalism, it will never deliver what it says it wants to. <laughs> and therefore, Glenn Greenwald. Glenn Greenwald does not come, I, I say this as a huge admirer, let me be absolutely clear. Glenn Greenwald does not come out of a radical tradition. He comes out of a tradition that takes liberal ideals seriously and begins to realize that actually existing liberalism is not delivering them. Liberals who are fundamentally liberals because they have because their fidelity is to the liberal state, will never, ever be on the side of change. Well, on that note, <laughs> thank you. A uh, big thank you to our panelists.